Support comes from the St. Louis Chamber Chorus. Season 68 concludes at John Burroughs at 3 p.m. on May 26th with the United Nations commissioned Voices of Today by composer Benjamin Britten, featuring youth and adult singers. Tickets at chamberchorus.org. This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. The UN estimates that 2 billion people across the world routinely eat insects. Living here in Missouri and Illinois, that statistic might come as a surprise. Few grocery stores and restaurants offer insects as ingredients. But the idea of eating bugs is catching on bit by bite. Crickets are a commonly eaten insect, and a little later in the segment, we'll learn how cricket powder is easing otherwise squeamish eaters into giving insects a shot. But the toast of the town right now is, of course, the cicada. A few weeks ago, we learned all about periodical cicadas with entomologist Nicole Priest. She shared that she was looking forward to seeing their historic emergence this summer and that she was particularly excited to eat them. We checked in with Nicole yesterday to see how her cicada hunting went. And so you go out and you want to collect them at night. So like 8 p.m. or later, usually like around dusk as it's getting darker, and they will start to come out of the ground and you want to collect them before they've shed their last skin. Um, So I was out there in the dark with my little flashlight collecting cicadas. (laughs) And um, then after that, you want to freeze them to kind of humanely euthanize them. And you can keep them frozen for a long time. And then I was able to bring those to work and eat my first one, which was really exciting. So what you do is you boil them for a couple minutes. And then we made a cicada scampi. And we fried them up um, with butter and garlic and white wine and lemon juice and a little bit of fresh parsley. And the texture, I thought it was going to be crunchy, but it was actually very tender and kind of savory in flavor, which it, I thought it was going to be kind of crunchy and earthy, but it was really tender and savory, which was exciting. That was Missouri Botanical Garden entomologist Nicole Priest. Joining me now is my colleague, Lara Hamden, who tried her very first cicada dish on Monday at the Butterfly House in Chesterfield. Lara, it's great to have you on to talk about this. Hi, Elaine. So what form or forms of cicada did you try yesterday? So like Nicole mentioned, I had that cicada scampi dish where it was fried in butter and garlic, and anything fried in butter and garlic is delicious. Right. (laughs) Um, We also had a... Uh, tempura fried cicada situation with some really nice um, uh, like a spicy ish sauce so um, that was really delicious and both I would definitely definitely try again okay mm-hmm. well so and this is not your first time with insect ingestion on purpose how do cicadas compare with other insects that you've eaten and, and you mentioned it's something about expectation. Was there anything else yeah. that was sort of not what you would anticipate? Yeah. So last year at the Butterfly House, actually, I tried crickets for the first time, and that those were cooked in a quesadilla situation. So they were kind. Of, that was my very first time ever eating bugs, and I. I mean, I could handle it because it was bit cooked in a quesadilla with cheese. And I noticed, like, it didn't really overpower anything. It was just like a slight crunch in the in the quesadilla. And I also had um, some worms that were uh, puffy and um, crunchy. Mm-hmm. So I, for the cicadas, I thought maybe this will be really crunchy. But they ended up being, like Nicole had mentioned, tender and more, um, I guess, fatty. And so the texture I would describe is like a cross between shrimp and chicken. Mm-hmm. And I would agree. I just yes. tried <laughs> the tempura one. We didn't think this was going to happen, but Elaine ended no. up. Yeah. I decided to uh, just take one for the, the team and for <laughs> all of you out there who maybe are, are a little bit squeamish. Now, you said that you would try it again, but what was it that compelled you 
to try insects in the first place? I mean, I think it's really important to step outside of one's world or comfort zone or whatever. And like you mentioned earlier, billions of people eat insects around the world. Right. And so I'm not above anything <laughs> that, you know, other people do. And it's incorporated in their regular culture and their regular, like, cuisine. And so... And I'm always of the mindset you should try everything at least once in life. Mm -hmm. And in this situation, I'll actually try them multiple times. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Laura Hamden is STLPR's engagement editor and our resident, sure, I'll try it on video <laughs> person. Thanks so much for sharing your first cicada dining experience with us, Laura. Thank you, Elaine. Now, as someone who's tried eating a wide variety of insects, including the ones we've been talking about, is our friend Tad the Bug Dad Yankoski, senior entomologist at the Missouri Botanical Gardens Butterfly House. And he's back on the show today to talk about cicadas as food. Tad, welcome back to St. Louis on the Air. Thank you for having me. So we heard your colleague Nicole Priest talking earlier about cicada hunting and doing so at night. So since that's the first step, it's the collection. Is nighttime the best time to harvest all the cicadas that are out there right now? Yes. So when we're cooking our cicadas, we are looking for the cicadas in the nymph stage, which is before they've shed their skin uh, and get their wings and come out as adults. Most of the periodical cicadas come out of the ground around 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And so that's a great time to go out and collect them as they're starting to adventure up to the tree where they would usually grab a hold and molt. You can also collect them in the afternoon after a rain shower. If, say, you get a late afternoon rain, you go out and you'll find a few crawling up the trees then as well. Mm -hmm. Now, how is it that you do the collection? Like, what kinds of tools do you need? What sort of a, a container? It's pretty simple. I go out with a flashlight at night and a paper bag, and I just collect them off of the trees and put them in the bag. It's also a great way to meet your neighbors if they're curious what you're doing uh, as you walk around the neighborhood picking cicadas off the trees. Mm -hmm. Is it too late this season, or are nymphs still coming out right now? Nymphs are still coming out. Uh, in parts of the city, some people haven't seen a single cicada yet, or really they just started to come out earlier this week. Mm -hmm. And so over the next week, you'll still see a lot of cicadas coming out of the ground mm -hmm. every evening. And that actually brings us to, to something that people on social media have been reporting, and generally it's that there are big numbers of cicadas in St. Charles and St. Louis counties, while in parts of the city, especially in South City, there haven't been that many seen. Why is that, Ty? So the cicadas come out of the ground when the temperature about a foot below the surface reaches around 64 degrees. And so it's very dependent on that. And so there could be microclimates in different areas where the ground temperature is a little warmer or a little cooler. And when they hit that temperature, they come out. And if it's not quite there yet, they might be delayed a few days or a few weeks behind other locations. Mm -hmm. And then once these cicadas then in that new stage have been collected, how is it that you prepare them for cooking? Like, do you, do you wash them? Do you <laughs> we do. So they are coming out of the ground. They dig little holes and come out, and sometimes they're covered in soil or debris. So the first thing we do is um, we do put them in the freezer to sort of put them to sleep and humanely euthanize them. And then after that, regardless of how we're going to prepare them, we rinse them really well under strong running water, and then we boil them for about two minutes. That gets the last little bit of debris and dirt off of them and also sterilizes their outside just in case there's any bacteria or stuff like that from the soil. Okay, and that actually brings me to another question. Are there certain cicadas that you should be avoiding? Generally speaking, the cicadas you're seeing coming out of the ground right now are all the nymphs of the periodical cicadas. Um, if you know there was an area where they were spreading a lot of pesticides, perhaps spraying for insects to kill them, you might want to avoid that area. We tell people make sure the cicadas appear healthy, and that basically means that they're crawling and acting like a normal cicada, that they're not on the ground twitching or anything like that. Okay. Uh, as long as they appear healthy, they're probably safe to... to uh, to harvest. Mm -hmm. And we've been hearing about these zombie mm -hmm. cicadas that have a, a fungus that is actually eating away at the body. Would that be harmful for people to ingest? And is that something that is visible from the time they are in that nymph stage? So the spores do infect the nymphs. That's when the fungal infection begins. However, 
it's they sort of lay dormant in the nymph cicadas, and they only really start to the the fungus only starts to aggressively grow once it becomes an adult. The minor minor amount that might be in a nymph seems to be totally harmless to people. If you do see adults that have a lot of the white spores that are on their back, you probably want to avoid those. But even then, there's been some evidence that suggests it's probably harmless. Mm-hmm. We have another guest today who has some familiarity with uh, entomophagy, which is the eating of insects. And she's got insects on the brain, in the belly, and in her business. And that is Sarah Schlafly, who's CEO of Mighty Cricket. It's a startup that produces food products that include powdered roasted crickets. Sarah, welcome back to the show. Hi, Elaine. So as you're hearing us talk about cicadas, have you tried cicadas yet? I did, yeah. This cicada season, I tried my first cicada. Mm -hmm. So your business, Mighty Cricket, is about normalizing the eating of insects. Why? Because 25% of the global population eats bugs, and it seems to me like it's an incredible source of protein. You know, from a resource consumption and given how our resor- our natural resources are shrinking and our population, our global population keeps growing, we have this growing food gap um, where we need to be producing more food. And protein is one of the most resource-intensive nutrients to produce. Mm-hmm. So when I stumbled upon this idea that 25% of our world eats bugs, I was like, wow, that's really fascinating as a sustainable food source going forward. And also that's really gross. (laughs) (laughs) But I had a background in the culinary arts and I thought of all the foods that I had previously consumed that originally I thought were gross until they were prepared in a way that was appetizing. For example? Um, I used to not like kale. I used to not like mushrooms, tomatoes, just like on and on (laughs) all the foods I didn't like. (laughs) So you were one of those kids? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't even eat a sweet potato, like plain white salt and butter. Wow. So you've come quite a long way. So then when it comes to insects that we find in our food, I am a huge fan. I may have a bit of a problem. Uh, I love Flaming Hot Cheetos. But the thing that makes the red, Tad, is is from insects, right? Yeah, uh, there's a, a scale insect that uh, lives in the wild on cactus and it's white but when it's crushed it turns bright red and we found out you can use that to color everything from wools and textiles to food like you know flaming hot cheetos (laughs) right so insofar as protein goes sarah how does the protein in insects and maybe in particular with crickets how does it compare to meats or plant-based What I really like is it's got the nutrition of a meat protein, but the sustainability of a plant protein. So this is wonderful bridge. You know, um, people who want to incorporate more um, that plant-based proteins into their diet, but they're feeling like they're missing that vitamin B12 or the um, complete all nine essential amino acids can turn to insects as something that's healthier, more Mm -hmm. sustainable, you know, um, very low in saturated fat. Yeah. Um, but you still get all those nutrients and meat. Mm-hmm. So something that I, I want to make sure that we get to, Tad, is that you are, in fact, a vegetarian. I am. But you both cook and eat insects. Well, what's the deal with that? <laughs> um, well, to, to be honest, I'm more of a pescatarian in that I do eat some uh, seafood and fish. Uh, however, though, I, I understand as a vegetarian when I'm eating you know, grains when I'm eating vegetables, there's so many insects that are in there essentially as contamination that you can never get rid of Mm, Right. that I'm already eating insects with every meal that I ever eat. And so to me, it's not that much of a difference between cooking them up purposefully and trying them that way Mm -hmm. as well. There's a study that suggests um, every consumer eats 385 bug bits every single day. 385. Well, they're small bits, though. Yeah, small bits. <laughs> Sarah, earlier, you'd used the term term gross, right? And we did a little of 
a little engagement that is to get folks' thoughts on eating cicadas specifically, but there's obviously some applicability to other insects too. Jennifer on Facebook has no interest in eating cicadas. If I'm here for the apocalypse and that's the only food source, she says, I'll reconsider. And then our colleague, Sarah Fenton, she says she would try crickets, but not cicadas, because for her, cicadas are too big and seem to have, um, quote, too many squishy parts. I (laughs) agree. So she adds that it could be the fact also that cicadas are so visible that it makes her not want to eat them. And that for the most part in the U.S., that we don't like to think about our food, that Crickets seem kind of self-contained, almost like a a plant, weirdly. Um, And cicadas just seem too visceral. How common a a reaction or or set of reasons is that, Todd? That's very common. When we're doing our insect cooking demonstrations, a lot of people are very hesitant to try them. And that is why we try to package them in fun ways. Like Laura said, she had her very first one as a quesadilla. Mm -hmm. And if you hide it inside something with cheese, somebody might be a little bit more likely to try it than cicada scampi, which is right right there in your face. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the nice thing about crickets. We joke that crickets are the gateway bug, that you (laughs) try a cricket, that you might try something else as well. And you can grind it up or bake it into cookies and you hardly know it's there. And once Mm -hmm. you're used to eating it, you realize it's just tasty. And then maybe you'll try it again or try something else. And then for your part, Sarah, what are the the reactions or comments that you get? um, And how do you how do you get people over that hump of of not wanting to to try it even? Our best strategy is to mill into a fine powder and then blend it into foods that just look like every other ordinary food that Americans are used to eating. And that's how I tried my first insect, um, which was a cricket, because it is the gateway bug for sure. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We just have this warm and friendly attitude towards crickets that we don't towards other insects. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I ground it into a powder, and I blended it into a smoothie, and I ate it. And it was perfectly fine. There was Mm -hmm. nothing strange about it. And then I, that was my aha moment, like, oh, if I can do this, then other Americans can do this. And it really gets you over that mental hurdle. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things with your business is that you're not just going out there sort of uh, scavenging or, or foraging for crickets. How is it that you raise and harvest them? So our crickets are farm-raised in a warehouse, and um, the harvesting process is the same. So we freeze it, which is a super humane way to euthanize the crickets. And then we do the exact similar process, rinse, blanch, dry, um, roast at a certain temperature to kill off any potential pathogens, and then blend it up. Mm -hmm. And you're developing plans for an automated cricket farm in St. Louis? What would that look like and, and how to work. Yeah, so I'm working with an engineer right now to um, work on the automation piece because what we want to do is really take out the manual labor part of cricket farming and drive down that cost so that it becomes a truly price competitive um, meat in the market where it's accessible to all people. Mm-hmm. So Todd, the, the insects that you've eaten among the ones that you've tried, which are the ones that you've enjoyed the most? Like in, in what preparations? I think the one that was the most surprisingly tasty for me was I had the leg meat of a giant water bug. Oh. And so uh, they're sometimes called toe biters. Okay. Um, they're eaten in a lot of Asian cuisine. Mm-hmm. And you have to crack their legs open just like you would a crab. And it's the tiniest amount of meat that comes out. But it's both very flavorful and a very unique taste. It tastes exactly like a banana dessert. And so we made swamp s'mores with them. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and every other component was the same. It was just that... Just a tiny little piece of the leg meat, no, you know, half the size of a pea, and that mm. replaced the marshmallow and gave it a banana marshmallow kind of taste oh, for that, the whole thing. That sounds delicious. Sarah, how about you? Let's see. I've had bees, uh, bee larvae, and I've had ants, but I really liked the uh, cicada dish. 
I thought that was oh, awesome.、Uh-huh. Yeah, but I find that the bugs I eat typically、um, it's about the preparation.、Mm-hmm. So if you try one bug, it might not taste that great because even crickets, from a flavor standpoint, depending on what diet they eat, their flavor changes dramatically. Okay, and that was actually a question. So my son、um, is part of a a Cub Scout troop. And one of the the families that we do this with, the kids listened to the the interview that I had done, done with Nicole, and they really got into cicadas then. And the, the younger of the two was wondering, do insects taste the way their food tastes, Tad? They do.、Uh, so one of the reasons we select the nymphs to cook for our cicadas is that the adults will snack on trees. They will drink some of the sap from trees. And so in my experience, I have eaten adult cicadas who had been feeding from trees, and you definitely get an oaky kind of taste from from that when they're feeding on the trees. Where the nymphs are much more mild, they're going to take on the taste of you know in this case butter and garlic. Right. That's always good.、Yes. <laughs> so Sarah. You have been on the show before. Since the time you were last on, has there been a a growth in interest in insect based proteins? I really think so.、Um, that was about five years ago, which is hard to believe that I'm on my sixth year of the company. But in the past six years, I've seen more and more. Um, news media coverage. It's being shown on TV and documentaries, and I've moved from. Most people not being interested or have never heard it. To now, it seems like there is definitely a little bit of spark that、um, happens in people's eyes when I say, "Oh, here's an opportunity to try, try bugs," and people actually had heard about it in、um, the media and they had been looking for an opportunity.、Mm-hmm. What are some of the ways that people use cricket powder? I mean, is baking sort of the first thing folks go to? Yeah, so、um, our chocolate and vanilla protein powders, most people throw it in a smoothie, but then we also sell the plain cricket flour, and that's really easy to bake into items:、um, muffins, pancakes, waffles.、Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I just stir it in a hummus or sprinkle it on top of some guacamole. Uh huh. And do you find that that kids are actually more inclined to try it than adults are? Oh, absolutely. Every time I、um, go to a school and ask for a raise of hands of how many people have tried bugs, it's the majority <laughs> already、uh-huh. <laughs> at grade schools and high schools and college. Like most kids have already tried them.、Mm-hmm. If people are interested in getting into the the culinary insects world, what are some good resources for them to to start with, Tad? There are many different recipe books that are out there, cookbooks just for cooking insects.、And、there's a lot of great uh, information. Uh, Mighty Cricket has a lot of great、uh, resources as well. At the Butterfly House, we're actually doing an insect cooking event this Friday,、mm-hmm. where guests can see the process of how we cook them. They won't be able to try the cicadas due to the limited、uh, availability, but we will have some cricket、uh, flavored snacks available for kids to try as well.、Mm-hmm. I think I heard that there are.、Um Salt and vinegar crickets available. <laughs> Very tasty. So, how does the cicada moment sort of rank for you,、um, insofar as your day to day job goes? Is this like you know the Super Bowl of、uh, entomology? Uh, uh, absolutely. This this is、uh, the Mount Rushmore of entomological events for sure.、Um, you know, I joked when I finally saw my first、uh, cicada that came out about two weeks ago. Um, my wife actually saw it first. She pointed it out, so she gets those points. But it was like seeing the Mona Lisa. I just stopped and stared at it, you know, and、uh, just took it in because this was, you know, for me it was the first time I've ever seen it, and I'll never forget that moment. Oh wow! So Sarah, you know, one of the one of the foods that we eat nowadays that is actually a high high price tag item is lobster. It's not something that we used to eat, right? And I think it's been called the insect of the ocean or of the sea. I mean, do you think that this year's sort of local explosion of cicadas will warm people up even more to the idea of this? Are you, are you hoping to incorporate cicadas at some point in the line of products that you are offering? 
Mighty Cricket might not venture into the cicada yet because we're still getting people accustomed to the cricket. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it's it's a very slow burn right now, but we're going to hit that inflection point where it just takes off. Um, and we've seen this happen in other foods. And as you said, lobster was one of those foods that used to be fed to prisoners and considered poor man's food. And then the sushi roll was used to be considered gross, eating raw fish and seaweed. And soon, pretty soon, bugs are going to be that next thing where we maybe today are kind of squeamish about it. And maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 15 years. It's going to be very normalized. Mm -hmm. Sarah Schlafly is the CEO of Mighty Cricket, and Tad Jankowski is Senior Entomologist at the Butterfly House for the Missouri Botanical Garden. Thank you both for joining us today, and uh, happy eating. Thanks so much. Thank you. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Doerr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thanks. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts.